Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Film Club Podcast, where every month we deep dive into a different aspect of cinema. A director, franchise, genre, or actor, it doesn't matter. It's always fun at the Film Club. I'm Dean. I'm Boo. And this month we're talking about westerns, and this week we're talking about... Blazing Saddles. Directed by Mel Brooks, starring Cleveland Little, Gene Wilder. It is a movie of 1974, and it is, uh, <laughs> it's a wild movie. It's a movie that wouldn't be made today, which has been said many and many time. That is like the most famous thing people refer to Blazing Saddles about is that it is a movie that could never be remade because it is uh, like the end word said in that movie like 80 times. Yeah. It is very like non-politically correct. I know a lot of people say that, but watching the movie... Like, I, I never felt like the movie was punching down at all. Like, I, it is it is a movie where I'm like, out of context, it probably wouldn't work. But in context of the movie, it's a pretty, like, progressive movie. Like, it's honestly oh, yeah. a giant satire of the undercover racism of the Western genre. Yeah, and I think that's what people need to walk into this movie understanding that it is satire. I mean, it's kind of like The Great Dictator, where people thought that Charlie Chaplin was praising Hitler when he was really making fun of Hitler. That is a take you only get if you never watched Great Dictator, if you only saw the clips. Yeah, and I mean, this movie, everybody's fair game in this movie. And we see why people might think, oh, wow, you know, they're being racist. And it's like, no, we're seeing the progression of our lead, Bart, who has been, you know, kicked down in his life, and now he's kind of risen to power and it was to do so to destroy this town but really he made everything better yeah and um, i guess before we get too deep for those who haven't seen blazing saddles i have the back of the box wow the the plot synopsis as it were <clears throat> bart is a african-american railroad worker that lands in some hot water after standing up to his nitwit boss his punishment to be the new sheriff to the racist town of rock ridge <laughs> Secretly, the nefarious attorney general hopes this change of status quo will allow him to run a railroad through the town as the people bicker amongst themselves. But Bart is able to befriend the town and thwart the villain's plot, culminating in a brawl that bursts out of Rock Ridge into the Warner Brothers' back lot, leaving Bart the victor as he rides into the sunset in a sweet Cadillac. Yeah. This is a Western. This is a Western. This is my kind of Western where, yeah... They're riding off into the sunset. You know, we're getting the whole Shane, Shane, that kind of thing. And then... Have you seen Shane? I haven't, but I know that scene. Everyone knows that scene. Of course. Of I, course. I watched Shane, like, not that long ago because it's like, oh, it's one of the best westerns ever. And I'm like, it's it's okay. It's all right. It, it's fine. Like, the, the kid... Okay. The movie's really pretty and it's a really good movie. The kid actor... Nails on a chalkboard. Oh my, they didn't invent mm. good kid actors until like the 1970s. I swear to God. Oh Lord. But, um, it happens. Yeah. But Blazing Saddles. Yes. This is a Mel Brooks movie. And this is kind of the tippity top of the Mel Brooks canon. Yeah. Because this comes out in 74. This is his third movie. Mm -hmm. His fourth movie is Young Frankenstein. They both come out in 74. Those two are his most profitable films combined. They make like $200 million, yeah. right? His first movie is The Producers. He wins like an Academy Award for Best Writing. Was High Anxiety after Blazing Saddles? Yeah. I, okay. uh, High Anxiety is like his sixth or seventh movie. Okay. It, it's a little bit a ways after this. But I'm, I'm bringing this up because, okay, this tippity top of Mel Brooks' career, and then he's never able to kind of come back and recapture this kind of like lightning in a bottle magic i'm wondering why do you think that is i mean that that's kind of a hard question for me because i feel like so many of his movies are lightning in a bottle because he's one of these directors where he thinks out of the box but when you think of mel brooks you know exactly what you're picturing with mel brooks it's comedy it's off the wall it's craziness but it works yeah so i feel like this isn't just the lightning in the bottle moment because we have young Frankenstein coming after this. It's like he's got hit after hit after hit. Well, the young Frankenstein, it's the same year, which is astounding to me. Like Blazing Saddles is like the number two most profitable film of that year. And young Frankenstein's the number three. Yeah. And it's like, that's why I'm saying like for 1974, like that era, 
insanely like high caliber stuff. But once you get to something like um, Spaceballs, yeah, which people really like, but it's um, Robin Hood Men in Tights. Robin Hood Men in Tights. They're movies where they're kind of fifty fifty yeah. in terms of the jokes that still land, and then by Dracula Dead and loving it, it's just nothing's kind of kind of <laughs> hitting anymore right it's still funny it's yeah they're still funny like mel brooks is a good comedian but it's a thing where i don't know if like did his humor change or was it a thing where his humor just didn't um keep up with the times and he was still telling jokes of 1974 that didn't work in the 90s or he just had so much money that he was kind of like ah, eh, you know you think he might have started phoning it in a little bit Maybe or just kind of like you know I'm I'm gonna start winding it down a little bit. I don't have to be as you know aggressive at it as I was because I mean that's a big task to take on Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein back to back. Yes. So it's like yeah, I could see you know in the later years and with some of the later movies where it'd be like okay, you know I'm not gonna be holding the reins as tightly as I was with some of the previous movies. But yeah, I mean Blazing Saddles is. Just one of those, like, you know, knock it out of the park movies. Yeah, I mean, I've heard people describe Blazing Saddles in the, like, top five comedies of all time. Yeah. Right? Same conversation as, like, Monty Python, The Holy Grail, Airplane, um, uh, Duck Soup. You know, like, really high-level, like, mm-hmm. comedies, right? And I'm wondering, do you think that is a valid um, thing to hang on Blazing Saddles. Is this one of those all-time comedies? Oh, Play it any year, any decade, you're going to get a laugh. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, some of the do- some of the jokes are dated in this movie. There's some references, like um, Gene Wilder makes a, a reference to, because um, Bart's telling him, oh, you know, you've killed, you know, so many men. And uh, Gene Wilder's character goes, no more than Cecil B. DeMille. And it's like, you know, you have younger audiences now who might not be into film, don't know who Cecil B. DeMille is, but for film enthusiasts like ourselves, I'm, we, we get the joke. I mean, the whole bit with the Attorney General, um, Hedley Lamar, yes. and it's like, it's Hedley, not Hetty, because yeah. Hedy Lamar was a actress from like the 1950s, 40s, 50s? 40s, 50s, somewhere in there, and there was a real lawsuit yeah. from her with this movie. And, and that's one of those things where I'm like, okay, that's a really funny bit if you know who Hedley, La- Hedley Lamar is. Hedley Lamar, yeah. But I mean, like, fucking, I don't think anyone knows who Hedley Lamar is now. Like, that's the kind of thing where yeah. the Mel Brooks style of comedy is very, like, kind of topical. Like, I mean, you look later down his career, Robin Hood Men Tights is a literal, like, one-for-one attack of Kevin Costner's Robin Hood Prince of Thieves. Mm-hmm. Spaceballs is a one for one like Star Wars Star Wars riff and it's it's interesting that his comedy is very works of the time and Blazing Saddles I think works great because it's referencing all the mm-hmm. western tropes and western clichés and like subverting them and making fun of them. He's the original spoof movie. Yeah, actually, yeah. Because, that would be I mean, a good, good, we um, have, you know, like, uh, the Scary Movie franchise. Um, what are the other ones where uh, they... Date movie, disaster, disaster movie, movie, epic movies, the movie movies, which yeah. I I am so glad those movies no longer exist. Oh, yeah. I mean, they totally phased out. And, you know, as time goes on, it's going to be the same thing where, you know, audiences later on that haven't been born yet watch these movies from you know, our decades, and they're like, I don't get the the joke. And that's kind of what goes with comedy sometimes. You know, slapstick comedy, someone falls down, breaks something, you get a laugh because you're, phys- you're seeing it, you know, you can relate to that. But topical jokes, you're either going to get them, you're not going to get them. And we have some in this movie, but we have a lot of physical comedy, intellectual comedy. Mm. There's a whole lot of playing on expectations in this movie. Yeah, uh, I mean, the whole... Um, the whole bit in the movie that I think is so funny is, okay, Cleveland Little, he's, you know, going in to be the sheriff. And the whole town does the whole, you know, sheriff celebration. <laughs> Welcome into town. Yeah. And then the old prospector is, the sheriff is a... And then yeah. beep, beep, yeah. beep, exactly. And it's so funny because I've seen so many of these old B-Western movies where the sheriff is coming into town they strike up the whole band it's all you know funny mm-hmm. or whatever and then the sheriff comes in and is like i'm gonna teach these you know young whippersnappers a lesson but he comes in and they're and they all pull the guns out on mm-hmm. him and all this other stuff and he's like nobody move oh the sheriff gets it and they're like do what he says do what he says and it, it's a fun like heightened 
reality that Mel Brooks is composing out yeah. of blatant Western tropes. I mean, one of the subtle gags in the movie is everyone in Rock Ridge has the last name Johnson. Yeah, that, that was something, you know, when you're sitting there in the church and they're doing like their uh, community meeting. And they're like, oh, you know, well, I agree with like Philip Johnson. Hey, you know, I agree with Van Johnson. I agree with Howard Johnson. And I'm like, there's either a lot of incest going around in this town or... A huge coincidence. Or no one's creative. Johnson, that sounds good. Town full of Johnsons. Well, I think that's a reference to some, again, some of the older B-Western movies that were coming out in like the 50s. Where you, if you look in the background of... Even some pretty like high profile westerns. I mean, I think we mentioned Shane earlier. Yeah. You can there's like four or five shops that just have the same name, like last name, like Johnson's horse carriage, you know, mm-hmm. Johnson's feed and whatever. And it's and it's kind of a reference to like, oh, some sets were just so cheap they would just paste the same sign over and over all across these oh, different absolutely. westerns. You know, like I can't tell you how many B movie westerns made on the Universal backlot had the smith feed and horse shop oh yeah there's so many of those but you know there's like subtle gags and stuff like that in there and then there's a lot of over the top kind of kind of gags in here Mm -hmm. but i'm I'm curious what is uh what's your favorite you know joke in the movie oh geez i mean there's so many um i mean even when i was watching the movie last night to prep for today you know it was like there's little jokes that you know i've probably glossed over when watching the movie before and it was just like oh huh that was a good one but i mean i think the one that probably sticks out the most to me it it's a physical uh bit is when they're beating up the old woman just, just to show how rough rock ridge is and they pan over to her and she's like can you believe the cruelty and they cut away and they're you know punching her in the gut again it's you know those subtle moments where it's just like what is going on here but this is hilarious it, it's the funny thing and i think Okay, well, let's get into this. What distinguishes a Mel Brooks comedy from maybe like a Monty Python comedy or like a Zucker Brothers comedy, right? Yeah. Like, because those ones, it's like Monty Python, it's absolute like absurdity. Yeah. <laughs> like nothing makes sense. And the joke is that it's absolutely absurd and these guys are just kind of rolling with it. The Zucker Brothers, you know, the, the airplane movies, mm-hmm. it's the world is an absolute is absolutely insane but no one acknowledges it like the comedy is the fact that to everyone in the movie this is a legitimate it's normal yeah legitimate a picture and they're not acknowledging that the world is insane what about a mel brooks movie makes that like what's that kind of comedy what's making it work because the because it's chaos Mm -hmm. but it's also some of the characters they break the fourth wall and they talk directly to the audience so it's like they know that this is crazy And they have to check in with you, but then they go back to the craziness themselves. So it's kind of like, is this all just crazy? Is life crazy? (laughs) It really makes you think, but at the same time, it's just, you're there to have a good time. It's smart, banty, you know, banter and, you know, witty, you know, one-liners. It's it's one of those things where the Mel Brooks comedies like to have you in on the joke. And that's, I think that's why his comedy tends to be really like topical. He's like, hey, guys, come on. You you remember that thing that happened, you know, to, to Richard Nixon or whatever? Yeah, come on. It's it's funny. Come on. Join in on the joke as they're making fun of this whole construction. You have Mel Brooks who plays the governor in mm. this movie. And, you know, he's completely incompetent. Um, he's constantly screwing his secretary. And, you of know, course. that's how we always catch him, you know, with his pants down and just, you know, I need you to sign this. What does this do? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, sounds good to me. I, I got to get back to, you know. The girls over here that need my attention. Stooping my secretary. Yes. So it's, you know, things that we can totally see like, well, yeah, there's always scandals with, you know, political figures, public figures. So it makes it very real with, you know, even though this is an imaginary character, I've totally seen this before in my life. Yeah. And I think that's, I'm wondering if that's why a lot of the jokes still like work is because he's painting kind of broad with the brush a little bit. Because the whole movie, I think the whole movie's point is the absurdity of, like, racism and prejudice, mm-hmm. right? Because Cleveland Little, who's playing Bart, is the most, like... Cleavon. Or Cleavon. Um, really? Cleavon? Cleavon, yeah. Oh, I thought it was Cleveland. No, not uh, Cleveland. Cleavon. Sorry. All right. Uh, Mr. Little. <laughs> he has the most... He has the most, like, smarts and poise. He's the mm-hmm. only guy in the movie that's, like, acknowledging that he knows er- how... 
okay, let me let me write this back because now now I got my thought. Little is the guy that knows everyone else in the movie is a fucking idiot, and yeah. he knows like he could like save the day. And out of the kindness of his heart, he's helping these dumb, dumb white people not lose their town. And it's not until he meets Jim Gene Wilder where he's kind of like. It's not just me that sees that there's something wrong with the mentality of this, the people in this town, but really everybody that he's come in contact with, you know, the people that are controlling the, the railways in the construction and how they're just so rude to the workers. And it's like, no, you, you've got Jim, who's just kind of like, buddy, I understand. They're all morons. Exactly. And I think that's the in- interesting thing is everyone who's portrayed as being a a racist or prejudiced or anything is objectively portrayed as being a moron, like yeah. an idiot. And I and that's the point of the movie where, hey guys, if you're a racist, you might be an idiot. Yep. And I think that's a really funny thing about the movie is that, pe- again, out of context, people watch some of the scenes and they're like, this is abhorrently racist yeah. the what is it slim Pickens saying the end we're like 15 times yeah but in context of the movie it's very much like no racism is stupid and we're calling it out throughout the entire mm-hmm. film yeah and again that's why i think the movie could granted i don't want this movie to be remade i think no. most remakes are generally Absolutely not good Absolutely not. but i can definitely see this movie having like a place in like a modern context like if you made a movie like this again and you had a very you know adept hand it could work like uh tropic thunder is Mm -hmm. one i like going to where people are like robert downey jr was in blackface i'm like yes the whole point is that blackface is fucking stupid Mm -hmm. you know like that's that's the joke about the movie and i think the i think you know, Blazing Saddles could actually have like a place if it got like a movie like it got made now. Which I don't think there should be because I think, you know, th- that's kind of my stance on a lot of these classic films. Leave them alone. Don't remake them. Come up with a new concept. I mean, if we were of this thing where we just remade things, there would be no progression. Well, I mean, that's the whole issue with a lot of Marvel movies now is yeah. that they're kind of it's the same basic generalized story just mm-hmm. repeated over and over again, which, like, I, I don't want to burst anyone's bubble. That's comic books in general. Yeah. It's, you know, there a lot of them were, like, morality tales, you know, and that kind of repeated over and over again. It's like, here's the good guy, here's the bad guy. Mm-hmm. This is what the good guy had to do to win, and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. But the whole thing with, with this, I don't want it to be, like, remade. I don't want a Blazing Saddles 2024, but if I got, like, you know, a, um, uh, a a blazing pirates movie right where it's a pirate movie but it has this blazing saddle style aesthetic and blazing style blazing saddle style humor i think it could work because i again we talked about this earlier blazing saddles could never be remade again why do you think that is because it's just the lightning in the bottle of you know a mel brooks idea the perfect cast I mean, the writers is a, are a murderer's row of oh, comedians. Yeah. Richard Pryor helped pen this. Yeah, and I mean, Richard Pryor was originally supposed to be Bart in the movie, but because of his drug use, his alcohol use, Mel Brooks had to be kind of like, you know, you are still my friend. I still love you, but I can't rely on you. And b- this all stemmed because he had hired him to be Bart in the movie, and he had, you know, taken a phone call from him, and he's like, oh, well, hey, where are you? And he was like, he was somewhere on the East Coast. He's like, I'm here in this like major city, and I don't know how I got here. Is, and and Bell Brooks was, was kind this of like before or after Richard Pryor lit himself on fire. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm not good with years. So I, it's like, I understand. Yeah, but um, do you think the movie would have been better if Richard Pryor was Bart? You know, I love Richard Pryor. He's so off the wall and hilarious. But I really think that this switch and casting really worked because i love cleavon little as bart he is so good in the movie i'm surprised was he in anything else after this after this i'm not sure um but i do know when i was doing my research was apparently he was a big broadway actor Mm, and uh gene wilder really helped him with acting to a camera and their relationship as you know best buddies in the movie actually was a real thing because they became friends really fast during the making of this so it wasn't like a 
you know, they're just good actors. It's like, no, they actually developed a friendship and that showed through the movie. Gene Wilder strikes me as the kind of guy that he's easy to get along oh, with. I love Gene Wilder. I was so sad when he passed away. Uh, like five, six years ago? Something like that. I'll, I mean, okay. Let, let's talk about like Gene Wilder because he's in the supporting cast here. Before we go there, I was going to tell you there is a show by Taika Waititi named Our Flag Means Death. It's mm. about pirates, about Blackbeard. I did recommend this to you. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So this is kind of like Monty Python, Mel Brooks craziness. It's, okay. it's really fun, so I recommend it. You should watch it. <laughs> okay, so so if I'm looking for a uh, Blazing Saddle or Mel Brooks-style fix with pirates, that that's my best bet. Yes. Okay. but um, Until Mel Brooks makes one. And Soon, soon. But, um, you know, Gene Wilder, he's the co-lead of this. He yes. goes on to be the lead of Mel Brooks' next film, Young Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. um, they have a very good relationship. I believe Gene Wilder continually comes back to Mel Brooks Mel movies. Brooks movies. Yeah. Like, I think he's he's in more than, like, these two. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Because he's, he's in the producers. producers. Um, is he in High Anxiety anywhere as a cameo or I, something? I don't think he is. Uh, I can't think of the other actor from Young Frankenstein who plays Igor. He's in Silent Movie. Yeah, yeah. But... So it, it's kind of this thing uh, with, like, a lot of directors where it's a lot of the same people that work together. But... Yeah, you know, Gene Wilder has done a couple of Mel Brooks movies. One of my favorite lines in the movie is delivered by Gene Wilder. I, I think you know... These are people of the earth, you know? Mountain folk. Morons. Morons. Yes. Well, that one and, you know, my name is Jim, but most people call me Jim. <laughs> and it's just this kind of like... That, that that's, the, that's one of those lines, you know, where in every, you hear it in like every Western where it's like, my name's Jim, but most people call me the Waco kid. And that's like, yeah. that's supposed to be the line, but he's just like, most people call me Jim. And that's, again, expectations changing it. It's taking all these cliches and tropes and just flipping them and making them funny. He's the Waco kid. A few weeks ago, we were talking about John Wayne, who was the Ringo kid. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, we're getting some of that classic Western in there where, you know, everyone has a nickname. Everyone has a story. Everyone's a badass. But um, like Gene Wilder, and then Wilder, that little boy shot me in the ass. Exactly. But Gene Wilder, he's the he's, you know, the supporting actor here. He's um, uh, playing the Waco kid, and I've seen I don't know a few Gene Wilder movies. You know, Willy Wonka, right? Is yeah. is the immortal role. Mm -hmm. You know. So, but do you do you think this is Gene Wilder's best movie, best work? You know, or is or is it one of those things where like the the air of Willy Wonka just holds head over head and shoulders over the rest no, of his career. No, I I think I'm biased because um, my in my opinion his best performance to me is Young Frankenstein, mm. and I'm not sure if it's because that's the first Gene Wilder movie I ever saw. Young Frankenstein, I think, is a lot of people's first Mel Brooks movie. Yeah, so. You know, I probably saw that in Willy Wonka around the same time, but uh, I'm I'm going with that's his best performance, and I think this is his second best. Real? You don't put Willy Wonka up there? I mean, I love Willy Wonka, but I just love his character as Jim the Waco Kid in this, where he's just, you know, this depressed, alcoholic shell of a man who was shot in the ass by a kid. He's playing Dean Martin's character from uh, Rio Bravo. Yeah. Yeah, the gunslinger who, you know, lot, who had to kill a kid and he's now a, you know, a drop down drunk, you know, because of guilt and whatever. And I love that, you know, Bart gives him a second chance. You know, he sees him for the first time as, you know, this drunk that's just, you know, in the cell, but he really gets to know him and they become friends and I love their dichotomy, but I also love seeing that Jim's more, you know, coherent by the end of the movie and he's back on his horse and he's back protecting people and it's just I I love that, you know, kind of that uh character arc that we get in this movie. Yeah, and you know, I've I think I've mentioned it a few times, you know, like maybe more than once that the movie is playing with a lot of those western tropes of oh, the gunslinger who became a drunk has mm. to, you know, clean himself up so he can come yeah. back and help the hero. But the whole movie, if you removed the comedy from the movie, it would play out like a 50s B-Western, yeah. right? Like, if you replaced, like, the Waco, you know, Gene Wilder with Dean Martin and Cleveland and Cleavon Little with, 
you know, a John Wayne or something, or I guess like a Sidney Poitier, because that would yeah. line up with the timeline better. And you could just make this as just a normal Western movie. Or right? you go Rat Pack. You'd have Sammy Davis Jr. You'd have Frank Sinatra. You'd have Dean Martin. Oh, actually, and... you, actually, yeah. If Mel Brooks sold this in nineteen like sixty three, mm-hmm. he could have sold this as a Rat Pack style um, Western, right? And I think that's something interesting. And this comes up in a lot in other comedies like Airplane mm-hmm. or um, like uh, Top Secret or whatever. A lot of the Zucker Brothers movies, where the plot is a is a real movie Mm -hmm. and then they add comedy and jokes and stuff on top of it blazing saddles works as like a real movie if you remove the comedy the movie still works yeah and i think that's something that a lot of comedies now miss out on and and this is kind of where i want to i guess steer the conversation because why does blazing saddles work so much better than a modern comedy does now because I don't know when the when was the last like modern comedy you watched. Does Renfield count? <laughs> We're gonna talk about that later, by the way. <laughs> but but I'm trying to think, you know, like like a themed comedy. Because I mean, Renfield would be a themed comedy. It, it's uh, a horror comedy. It's yeah. a horror comedy. We saw Dungeons and Dragons. That was a comedy. Yeah, action and adventure comedy. Um, I'm thinking something that's more like like this, where you would co- quantify it as a straight comedy. And I think that's something interesting because. I'm trying to think of a comedy that even runs close to a Blazing Saddle style concept. Like it's a it's a kind of a big production genre. It's comedy. a genre comedy. That's why you know I feel or like a satire. I guess a satire. Okay, satire. Um, I don't know. I mean, I love satire films, and it just I can't think of you know anything recently that I saw off the top of my head that would be close to blazing saddles yeah because i mean there's a lot of satires that came out i know don't look up was a satire about you know modern culture medium blah 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 but that movie's um i don't think that movie's actually all that good um but the thing is is a lot of comedies like the the movie movies we mentioned those earlier from Mm -hmm. the early 2000s yeah those movies are just kind of taking what's happening in like a scream movie and just copy pastaing it and changing Mm -hmm. just enough of it so that it's, you know, it's close, but, like, we can't get sued, guys, yeah. right? But once those started going down later down the line, like, disaster movie mm-hmm. or epic movie, those movies are non-functional. No. Without the jokes involved. A lot of, like, um, those SNL improv comedies that they started coming out, like, um, uh, oh, God, what was that um, Will Ferrell comedy near the, oh, Campaign. Will Ferrell, campaign, yeah. yeah. Will Ferrell's Galifianakis. Mm-hmm. That movie has like a a, a th- bare thin plot, and without the comedy, that movie's just not very interesting. Yeah. With Blazing Saddles, I feel if I took the comedy out, it would still work. It would still be an, an interesting enough movie. Yeah, it would be a western. Yeah, it would just be. It would just work as a western. And that's why you know I kind of feel like this movie just isn't a comedy on its own. It feels more like a genre film because. It is focusing on the Western genre until the very end when we break the fourth wall and we end up on the sound stages of Warner Brothers. Yes. Which is my favorite part of the movie. When it when it just fully drops the <laughs> artifice kind of thing. But it's, it's so funny because it drops the artifice while everyone is trying to maintain the joke, maintain yeah. the artifice of it all. And then you have people that are living in real time at the sound stages just visiting And they're part of the joke, too. And then, you know, they walk out of it like, oh, okay, that was normal. Like, okay, let's go see the the practical uh, effects department. So that's what happens on a film on a film set. Cool. Cool. And I and I think that's um, really interesting because in something like uh, Young Frankenstein, right? The artifice never drops, you know, like in Blazing Sounds. Like they never jump out to the backstage or whatever. And I don't even think in Young Frankenstein you get any like fourth wall jokes. Um, I mean, you get Marty Felpin, that's his name, who plays Igor in the movie. You get him kind of interacting with the camera sometimes. You also get Gene Wilder kind of interacting with the camera sometimes. Okay. So it's like you kind of get just little bits of it, but it's, it's not, not like... It's not as upfront as Blazing Saddles. Yeah, like, you know, Hedy Lamar, like where he'll, you know, stop and he'll ask the audience something. And he's like, never mind, never mind. Let me, you know, figure it out and goes back into 
character. I love I love in the third like when they're going into the third act, he's like, "Now ladies and gentlemen, you may be risking your lives and I most certainly am risking a Academy Award supporting actor nomination." Yes. And again, it's it's jokes like that where I think that's why the Mel Brooks movies work so well or like that's the that's the spice in a Mel Brooks movie is when he's breaking the fourth wall, he's saying, "Hey guys, I get you guys understand none of this is supposed to be serious it's a mm-hmm. joke exactly you know he he's he strikes me as the kind of guy he would like tell a joke nudge you on the side and be like come on buddy you you know that was funny and kind of like you'd be like yeah yeah okay yeah it was yeah. funny you know it's a it's a lot of like that nudge nudge wink wink you you know what i'm saying right you yeah know, just I, get a laugh i'm in. not trying to be hurtful i'm just trying to make you laugh yeah do you think the movie is is offensive in any way I mean, you know, or hurtful, I guess. I mean, it's always odd to hear, you know, a derogatory term, you know, when you don't use them. But mm-hmm. I mean, everybody is getting into this movie. Uh, the Mexicans get it. I mean, we even get a we don't need no stinking badges. We do get. Yes. Which is I almost <laughs> fell off of my seat last night because I, I forgot that that was in there. But uh, also, we went to Warner Brothers this past week. Oh, but before we go, we also get a, um, you know, we'll accept the Chinese and we'll accept the, the blacks, but no Irish. We will not accept the Irish. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's fucking Irish. <laughs> and, and then you have Bart. He's like, no deal. And All the right, guy's we'll like, okay, everybody, Irish. you know, everybody come and everyone starts hugging. But uh, I was going to say, you know, we went to Warner Brothers. But in the the tour's opening package where you watch, you know, clips of over the 100 years of Warner Brothers, yeah, they, they say, you know, they have the clip, you know, we don't need no stinking badges. And I, I, I was, you know, dying, you know, during that scene. But I was just like, forgot that it was in this movie. There's so much jam-packed in this movie, even though it's a fast movie. Yeah, and it, it is a fast movie. It's 93 minutes, yeah. which is, like, really weird because I remembered the movie being... Like, okay, the movie's paced really well, right? There's not, it's not a thing where it's like, oh, it kind of just like flies past you. But I thought I was like, is this movie like two hours? I remember it being longer, but yeah. it's not the fact that I remember it being longer. It's just, I remember all the jokes in the movie. And if I laid those out end to end, it'd be a two hour movie. Yeah. It's two hours worth of jokes jammed into 93 minutes. And we haven't even talked about our leading lady of the movie. Oh, yes. Madeline Kahn. Madeline Kahn. One of my favorite comedians. She's also been in a good amount of Mel Brooks movies. She was in High Anxiety, Young Frankenstein. Um, it, it's weird because throughout the 70s, he works with like a lot of the same mm-hmm. people. And then the 80s happen. And then he works with not as many of the same mm-hmm. people. And by the 90s, they're all like, yeah. he's working with new people every every movie. Yeah. It's I wonder if that's a thing, like, once the actors he, you know, worked with in the 70s kind of aged out and he had to use different people, like, the movie started dropping, because I mean, it, we'll talk about it in a minute, right? Yeah, I mean, it's also life, too, you know, life things, people might might have been, you know, hey, I think I'm going to retire out of doing, you know, some of these things, I'm not going to work as often, uh, deaths occur, hmm. so, yeah, you know, things happen, but Madeline Kahn. She is hilarious. Uh, she plays, what, what is her name? Lily von Stupp? Lily von Stupp. Uh, She's so tired. So, so tired. Mel Brooks's most dirtiest song he's ever written. Yes. Which is funny because I remember, because I watched this as a kid, right? Yes. And okay, this is probably not a great movie to show like a, a, a six-year-old, seven-year-old. Just because they'll pick up words that they probably shouldn't repeat. Yeah. But I remember watching this and I'm like. Why is she so tired? Why is she so tired? And it's one of those things where it's like, okay, as I get older, I'm like, oh, this (laughs) this song is filthy. (laughs) Oh, my word. But as a kid, it's like it's subtle enough. You don't get all all of it, you know. But yeah, Madeline Kahn. What a looker, right? Yes. And I mean, I love that uh, she is tied to Hedy Lamar, that she is the woman that takes people down when he can't do it himself. And she he brings in the ringer to take down Bart, and she ends up falling in love with Bart. Because it's two. It's two. It's two. It's two. <laughs> it's, I, uh, I mean, we, we get that amazing trope when she's, you know, let me slip into something more comfortable. And she comes out in some th- in, a, in a Playboy bunny outfit. More or less, yeah. It, it is one of those things where I'm like, did Mel Brooks just, like, pass off 
all the sex jokes to Madeline Kahn. Yes, because she delivers them so well. It's the same in Young Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. She's got all these one-liners sexual towards the end of the movie. That's just like, wow. Like, you know, if I, you know, if I missed it, I really would have missed it. But I mean, she just, you know, she hits those one-liners and it's like, damn, that was good. I And I think that's a thing. Like, a lot of the Mel Brooks comedy comes from, like, that comedic timing. Mm-hmm. You know, because his writing is very, um, the writing's very distinctive. Like, you can mm-hmm. tell a Mel Brooks joke by just listening to it. Yeah. And you need a good comedian to deliver a lot of those lines because, let, let's be honest here, if you took Slim Pickens' l- lines from the movie and you gave them to, like, anyone else, they would sound bad. They yeah. would sound, like, offensive or mean or they just wouldn't land as well. But because, you know, Slim Pickens got that weird voice and mm-hmm. he can make it funny. And Madeline Kahn, with all those sex jokes, if you gave it to someone like, I don't know, like another female actress of the time, yeah. um, Faye Dunaway, right? She, yeah. she was working at the time. It wouldn't work as well. Like, you know, Faye Dunaway, yeah. you know, 74, is pretty hot. Doesn't really work Mm-mm. all that well just because that timing and the delivery isn't there. Madeline Kahn is actually like, has a lot of the a lot of the great chops to be a comedic actress. We mentioned this when we did High Anxiety. Cloris yeah. Leachman is so funny, and I wish she got into doing comedies back in the fifties instead of starting them in the seventies. Yeah, but I mean, Madeline Kahn as an actress, you know, has great timing. Um, but in this movie, I feel like she pulls a lot of Mae West into mm. her character, where she's just this vivacious woman that everyone wants as she's able to bat out these one-liners you know she's able to take on the men in this movie like uh i think what is it the guy tex that has his feet up on the stage get your feet off the stage yeah she's like are you an actor no then get your feet off the stage and she kicks his feet off the stage so it's you know she's got so much in her she has crowd work right she's got crowd work she's the perfect person for this role and it's it's a thing where Almost, like, all, actually, no, all the casting works. Yeah, and I love, you know, even at the end of the movie, which I didn't notice before, Mm -hmm. um, I noticed, you know, after we see Lily, who's supposed to be, like, this sex symbol for, you know, Rockridge, she looks more kind of like Marlene Dietrichs. Yeah. She's in, like, you know, these really elaborate, you know, outfits and hats, and I was kind of like... Well, I think that's a callback, because I think Marlene Dietrich famously could not sing, and what uh, Madeline Kahn is doing is basically an impression of her in the in the movie, because you know when she starts singing the song, it's hilarious because she's singing this you know sexy you know I'm so tired they're coming and going, going, and, going and going and, going and coming. coming. She's singing this song, but she can't really sing because yeah. it's all tone deaf. It's just in this um, German accent that you can tell is not a good German accent. No, and, and then it's, you know, and it makes it. Funnier. And then you have her physical comedy where she's like, you know, dragging a chair across the stage so she could just sit down. The fact she has to deliver every line by putting her leg up onto a chair <laughs> or onto a couch. Like she like she's like, I can only deliver my lines if you can see my legs. Like yes. that it's the it's the thing where it's a really subtle gag. And you don't notice it on the first try. But when you watch it, you're like, every time she delivers a line she has to like show her leg off to like distract you that she's singing it in a bad german accent and that was also a thing during her um audition mm-hmm. was that uh mel brooks asked her to like i guess she was wearing like maybe a, like a long skirt or a long dress and he asked her to lift it because he wanted to see her legs and i guess it's because they're going to put her in the costume and he wants to see if you know if- she if she could pull it off well apparently she was so thrown by it that she kind of you know almost didn't take the role of the movie and there was another actress that told her you know no i don't think he's being a creep i think he's you know it's like you're gonna be a sex pot in the movie yeah it's kind of the point yeah he, she's like i think you're you know over analyzing it so we almost didn't get madeline Kahn in this movie and uh, that would have again the casting in the movie is like perfect down yeah. the board which like i think if you if you miscast anyone oh the, the actor who plays hedy lamar yeah. Hed, hedley Headley, Harvey Corman. Harvey Corman. He is great in this movie. Oh, he, I love Harvey Corman. He steals the show. He is so funny. He he has some of like the worst jokes in the movie. Like the jokes where you're like, okay, this doesn't this doesn't really work all that well. And then he has some of the f- 
best fucking lines in the movie. I mean, he has some of the best delivery in the movie, and it's it's a thing where I'm like, you carry so much of the of the jokes of the movie. It's insane. I mean, like when he goes to Grauman's Chinese theater. Because, you know, we're getting out of this picture, and he's going to go see a picture to kind of, you know... Well, he's going to go see Blazing Saddles, see how it ends. He is. But I love that, you know, he he gets in line to buy a ticket, and he pulls out, he's like, oh, um, student ID. Are you kidding me? Yeah, it's like, I love that interaction where it's just like, yeah, this is Harvey Corman, you know, uh, or him with his rubber frog. Mm -hmm. It, it He is playing it. Like almost like a Leslie Nielsen, mm-hmm. where you know the the comedy of Leslie Nielsen and all the Zucker Brothers movies was everything to him was completely serious. He was in an A picture. He was a leading man, and he is going to play this absolutely seriously. And do not call me Shirley. Exactly. Harvey Corman is doing that half the time, and half the time he is as ridiculous as um, Mel Brooks, and sometimes he's as serious as. Cleavon Little, and it's like he, he is running this gambit of being like, I am a serious villain, and I'm going to deliver lines that only a a B picture comedian could possibly deliver them to you. And it's again the range he is portraying in this movie is great. Have you seen the Carol Burnett show? Um, n- no, I know of it, but I've uh, never seen an episode. Harvey Corman's part of that cast. It's kind of like SNL. It's like a pre-SNL sketch show. Yeah, and I mean, they're always breaking during the gags because they just, they come up with these, you know, off-the-wall things and it makes them laugh. And I mean, Harvey Corman is just so talented and he keeps you laughing. I mean, subtle things, like when he keeps hitting his head on the window every time he goes out to, you know, for the hangings. Yes. And then you have, you know, the... The medieval guy that's doing the hangings. I love how he shows up in uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights. Yeah, so it's again. like, you know, all these Easter eggs, you know, things that are, you know, you may have seen it in a 70s movie, but you'll see it again in the 90s mm. because it exists in the Mel Brooks universe. Yes, um, but the Mel Brooks universe, right? Yeah. I think we opened with this, but I kind of wanted to round us back to it. The Mel Brooks universe, right? Mel Brooks, he is 96 years old, 97? I think he's 96. Yeah, Older guy, right? Mm-hmm. And he stopped directing in like the later 90s with uh, Dracula Dead and Living It. Yeah. That was his last theatrical release. He's come back. He's doing History of the World Part Two. Everyone's like, oh my God, we're getting more Mel Brooks. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's go. Now, I don't know how much of it he's actually directing. I'm pretty sure he's writing, producing, or like doing like a show run of yeah. it, right? Now, Mel Brooks, pretty famously, the Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein his biggest career successes Mm -hmm. right 1974 the year of mel brooks yeah every film after that is making half as much money or it flops right yeah and i'm wondering you know and i we talked a lot about blazing saddles that lightning in a bottle that magic Mm -hmm. why do you think he couldn't reach the same heights as blazing saddles again no i mean the 70s was kind of you know If the 60s was big because we're moving away from, like, the big Hollywood, you know, musicals, epics, 60s were, you know, a little bit... It was the last stages of the studio system before it kind of fell out of fashion. And then 70s, we, you know, have, like, Scorsese, and we have more serious, we have more dramas. I think maybe that's why, you know, we didn't get another another Blazing Saddles, because we were just getting so many different genres of films in the 70s that I think that more people were kind of like... Well, maybe I, I don't want to laugh. Maybe I want to go see a serious movie or, you know. You, you think it has something to do with the climate they came out in? Yeah. Like the 70s was a lot more fertile to these kind of more off-the-wall kind of weird, you know, pictures? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can definitely see that because, like, the 1980s is where he starts having kind of a, a pretty – noticeable like drop probably and, because people didn't want to re- like have him make another blazing saddles yeah and i mean the 80s were the blockbuster decade so it's mm-hmm. just you know high school blockbusters uh terminator all sorts of you know brand new things that we hadn't seen before so it might have just been you know okay you know what i'm gonna take a step back and i've got my movies that have you know really wowed audiences yeah and and by the 90s come around like it's I, I think by the time the 1990s came around and Mel Brooks was like, hey, I'm Mel Brooks. I got a name. I got this. I got mm-hmm. the pedigree. I think that that climate of the 70s where all of his comedy worked really well 
kind of just finally moved past him. Yeah. And it's hard to tell the same jokes for 30 years and still have them work. Yeah. But for this joke, Blazing Saddles works. Oh, yeah. I mean, phenomenal movie. Yeah, I want to watch it again. <laughs> I mean, I try to watch it at least once a year. And yeah, I might watch it again. Uh, now that we have like a physical tie to it, you know, being able to go to Warner Brothers and walk, you know, where some of these... The sets were done. Some of the shots yeah, were done. Cause yeah, because I don't think we told anybody in this. We went to Warner Brothers Studio uh, really recently. Yeah, earlier this week. Uh, we went and, you know, looking at like Rock Ridge, I'm assuming that that was the uh, Warner Brothers ranch that was just recently torn down. Yeah, I mean, the church is still there. Yeah, the church is still there. Um, we were there the day before their 100th anniversary, so we didn't get to actually go up to the church like I had hoped. Mm. But we were still, you know, in close proximity. Uh, the mountain range behind Warner Brothers is the same mountain range that they you, ride see, off into. you see in the movie. Uh, the gates where everyone goes running out at the end of the movie. We were able to walk up to those gates and look at them. So it's very surreal being able to walk in the footsteps where, you know, some of these epics were made. Yeah, and and I think that's, you know, it's really, it's really cool because Blazing Saddles has a really, has actually made a really big impact on a lot of people, you know, because when we were there... There were people who were asking about Blazing Saddles, you yeah. know, like, well, where was that film? And the guy's like, oh, it was filmed over here, over here, over here. But it's like, the person who was asking was like a 15-year-old kid there with his mom. And I'm yeah. like, one, why is your mother showing you Blazing Saddles? You are far too young. And two, like... That was around the time that I saw Blazing Saddles via my mom. <laughs> yeah, no, I... <laughs> okay, so you were like 15 the first time you saw Blazing Saddles? 14, 15, somewhere in there, yeah. I was like six. Again, my... Because... Famously, my parents did not give a shit what I watched. My parents were like, anything and everything, we don't care. As long as you understand it's a movie, it's not real. And right? as long as it's not Scarface. Scarface and Clerks are the only two movies I was not allowed to watch. That That's right. <laughs> Scarface with Al Pacino and Kevin Smith's Clerks were the only movies I was forbidden from watching as a child. Yeah. And I'm like... Again, like young young Frankenstein, I get like that's way easier to pitch to a kid. Oh yeah, you know, Blazing Saddles. I'm like this, this is a different kind of movie, right? But, um, I think it's so fascinating that Mel Brooks, if he only made Blazing Saddles, I think people would call him a genius. Yeah, and if he only made Young Frankenstein, people would say he made one of the best comedies of all time. Yeah, and if he's like if he only made the producers he'd be considered one of the funniest comedy writers of like the 19 you know 60s hollywood 70s hollywood but he did all of them and he, I'm like, he's the whole package he is the whole package and you know i really hope you know we can get one more you know mel brooks like directed film that would be amazing you know i'm, I'm hoping for right hoping for it right yes. it's probably because he's you know he's like 96 and he's like i fucking don't want to do this anymore what the fuck's me but you know he's 96 he's still you know smart as a whip he's still on it with the comedy and he's it's still like, a great interview still a great interview so it's like yeah i would love to have one more big epic mel brooks movie and be able to see it real time in a theater yes but i think that's going to bring us around to the end of this episode is there anything you wanted to say before we clocked out? Any boo facts, boo trivia? I mean, there's so much, but I think I'll keep it a, a really simple, fun trivia fact. So the premiere of this movie was actually at the Pickwick Drive-In in Burbank. Oh, fancy. Uh, that drive-in was also used in Greece. Mm -hmm. But what was cool about this was that the people that showed up to the, pre or to the premiere, they showed up on horseback. And because it was a drive-in, People were able to watch the movies on horses and kind of feel like you're having like this Western surreal moment. Which ties into the end of the movie when they just burst out of the screen. Right? They burst out of the screen and they're running down the streets. And I mean, it's Burbank, so Warner Brothers is not too far away from where the Pickwick was. <laughs> now that that's funny. I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. So gotta, gotta give into the Western vibe, the aesthetic. I just give into, you know, the Burbank studio system vibe because <laughs> man, I love being at an old studio. But yeah, so Blazing Saddles, I, I'm i going to assume you'd recommend. Highly recommend. Two thumbs up. Uh, if you've never seen it, watch it. If you've never seen a Mel Brooks movie before, 
run and watch his movies because he is a phenomenal writer, director, actor, producer. He does everything. Yes. Including acting in his films. Yeah, uh, I would have definitely agree. Blazing Saddles, I think it's a top five comedy of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty easily. I'm so happy it held up because I watched uh, one or two Mel Brooks movies that didn't hold up nearly as well as when I was like 10, 15. Mm -hmm. But very happy Blazing Saddles holds up. I think it's a great movie. I think it's so smart, so funny. Uh, and I like that we did it for Western Month because if Stagecoach was the template for Westerns and Good and the Bad and the Ugly was like the revisionist and Blazing Saddles is the parody. Yes. And I think they all work so well together. But what are we doing next week? Next week, we are rounding off Western Month. We are. And we're talking about a movie from the 90s. Yes, the Western Revival. Because, let's be honest, the Westerns kind of disappeared for most of the 1980s and kind of disappeared for most of the 1970s. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about Tombstone. Arguably, um, this is one of the greatest Westerns ever made. I have heard people make that statement that Tombstone is one of the best Westerns ever made. This is one I haven't seen since the 90s so really yeah this is gonna be brand new to me because it's been a very long time i i have a fun story about the first time i saw tombstone I'll, I'll spoil it now the first time i ever saw tombstone i'm 13 years old 14 years mm -hmm. old something like that i'm on my va vacation with my cousins right okay and we're going to like an old western town right my yep. cousins had like a timeshare was it calico oh no it was tombstone we went oh, to tombstone awesome. arizona we go through the thing, and they're like, oh, we're going to go see the shootout of the OK Corral. I'm like, what the fuck is that? And my cousin's like, Tombstone. And I'm like, we're at Tombstone. What the fuck do you mean, idiot? And he's like, OK, bro, have you not seen fucking Tombstone? And I was like, oh, it's a movie? I know. And then we watch <laughs> Tombstone in my hotel room, and I'm like, this shit is fucking fire. It's oh bussin', bussin'. It's bussin'. It's sh this shit is litty. And I watched Tombstone like four times that night before we go see uh, before we go to the shoot out of the okay corral the next day and i'm like this is fu so fucking cool you know fucking val kilmer's a fucking badass kurt also russell, kurt russell. <laughs> kurt russell right sam elliott it's a great movie but i have not seen this movie since then yeah so i haven't seen this movie in like almost 15 years so i'm very excited to revisit it I'm very excited but where can they go to see that if you want to listen to us on a different platform than you currently are you can find us on apple Podcasts, spotify uh, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and eventually this e episode will end up on YouTube. Yes, it'll eventually end up on YouTube. I'm narrowing down. We're almost at one-to-one -one release dates, but hey, if you wanted to see my lovely slideshows on YouTube, you can go to the Film Vault. That is the Film Vault on YouTube. Like, comment, subscribe. We are eventually going to get around to uploading video versions, like we're, real video yeah, versions. Yeah, we're working on it. But until then, you got to go and listen to some of our older episodes. But if you wanted to follow us on social media to find out when we're going to do video of podcast, where can they go? You could go to our Instagram page, The Film Club Podcast, where we post daily stories, updates, uh, maybe even a premiere or two. You never know at The Film Club. You can follow us and see our random adventures we go on. But with that, we'll see you next week at The Film Club. Have a good week, everybody.